Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, as you know, I, after World War II, I came out of the Army. I've been in England, France, Germany. Uh, I was able to go back to school on the GI Bill of Rights, became a television engineer by degree. So I have the fundamental knowledge of how to build television design, build television receivers, and also studio equipment. About 20 years later, I'm looking at uh, 40 million television sets in the United States alone, maybe another 40, 50 million in the rest of the world. And what do they do? You attach the antenna, antenna to the tennis terminals, and then if you're lucky, if you're in a big city, maybe you get four or five stations, and you uh, and you passively watch what's going on the screen. So, to me, that said, gee, I've got to be able to do something with this display machine that would be very expensive. It wasn't made by the millions. Right? Uh, the idea came from, wherever ideas come from, how about playing games? At the time, I was running a division of engineers and technicians, like 500 of them. I put a couple of guys aside in a small room, and told them, show me how to move a spot around on the screen, or you know, make it into a line, move it from side to side, up and down. Once we knew what we were doing, we built a big chassis and kept putting more and more stuff in there as we had generated ideas. And pretty soon we had two spots up there that were chasing each other, wiping each other out. We're shooting at the screen with light guns. Yeah, we're doing puzzles. We're doing uh, using light pens to to for a quiz in a quiz mode. Uh, we had we had uh, joysticks at the time. We had hand controls. We had color. We had we had in fact we had voice in the machine. In order to demonstrate the machine properly, once I built a a, a circuit. Uh, four and a half megahertz oscillator circuit inside the machine to which I fed an audio tape player which explained each game in turn that was about to play. And the voice came out of the loudspeaker on the television set. So in 1967, we had video games with voiceover instructions, including color, using joysticks, light guns. Yeah. So an awful lot of that stuff is the DNA of present day into the games. But that's how it all started. And we iterated through several models, seven of them total. The last one being a brown box, of which we have one in the, in the museum. Uh, in between, we tried our hand at making a producible model. That was number three. It was a small box that played a chase game, that's what chase game other, and a uh, light gun game. But the middle material was close to twenty dollars at the time, uh, which that was just wasn't enough play value for what would have what would, would have been a fifty, sixty, or seventy dollar product. So we knew we didn't have anything. Then along comes Rush, and he says, "How about a third spot? Right? What do we do with a third spot? We put our heads together. Obviously, ball games. Right? By, by November of '67, we had ping pong games going." Once we had that, we knew we had something. Yeah. And from there, uh, we kept developing it. The question thing was, now that we have it, what do we do with it? Who wants it? Who's going to develop it? Who's going to take it on? And the first idea was to uh, interest the cable companies. There were two major cable companies in the country, uh, which Teleprompter was the largest. We got into an agreement with Teleprompter. We were pretty far down the road. I uh, mean, teleprompter produced shows where the background, colorful background, would be transmitted by the cable station. We would overlay our crude symbology on top of that, like Wimbledon uh, in the background, and our tennis game on top, uh, three spots on top of Wimbledon. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, cable business was uh, very bad. The cash flow was negative, and it all went nowhere. And then we took another two years before we finally decided, hey, the television sets out there have, have the same self same components in them that we have in our little game box. Right? We just need the individual transistors, resistors, capacitors, in logic circuitry, in some analog circuitry, mostly pulse circuitry. And so we paraded all the television manufacturers through our national plan. In those days, we were still manufacturing television sets in the United States. It, it hadn't given the business away yet to Japan. 
was Philco, there was RCA, there was GE, there was, there was uh, Magnavox, and, and many others producing television sets. They sent delegations to Nashville, New Hampshire. We made our demonstrations. They all said, Jesus is great. But never, nobody came across with a license agreement except RCA. And by the time we finished that agreement, it was so onerous for us that we walked away. Fortunately for us, one of the members of the RCA team left RCA, became a VP, Vice President for Marketing, at Magamox in a New York office. And he told the guys in Fort Wayne at headquarters, you've got to see this again. He was so impressed. And that started the ball rolling. We went to Fort Wayne, we demonstrated. Jerry Martin, who was in charge of television sets and radios and photograph, and ran a factory in Tennessee, uh, said it's a goal just like that. One guy with vision, and it all went out from there. Um, so maybe you can also tell us a little about, about the situation. I lost your voice again, Anna. Yeah. 